Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Fintech Istanbul's webinar. Uh, I hope you are all uh, good. Uh, today I have two disting distinguished guests from uh, Finexus and Amani. Uh, since uh, Hamid's Turkish is still uh, in progress, uh, we will present this uh, seminar uh, in, uh, in English. Um, Mr. Ahmet Vefik Dinçer, the CEO of uh, Finexus. Welcome, Ahmet Bey. Hello. Welcome, Mr. Selim. And Mr. Hamid Khan, the CEO of Amani. Welcome, Hamid. Thank you. Merhaba. Merhaba. Okay. Wow. You're in progress. Slowly. <laughs> uh, I think many of you know uh, Finexus for a, a long time. Uh, we had some webinars before with Finexus also. You, uh, you may uh, uh, remember that. Uh, let me say a few words about Amani. Uh, Amani is a fast-growing company uh, in the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, they invested in Turkey in 2019. Am I right, Hamid? That's right. We came March 2019. Okay. Since then, uh, they are creating AI-powered solutions for uh, identity ver verification. Uh, I know Hamid personally from the first day that he stepped in Istanbul. Uh, and within a couple of years, uh, his company, um, uh, Amani, became an important player in the ecosystem. And of course, they have a good partnership uh, with Finexus. Uh, that's why uh, we called both Finexus and Amani uh, on the same stage. Uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, very hot topics, especially in Turkey's agenda. Uh, as Fintech, in co uh, collaboration with Finexus, uh, you may remember that. Uh, we have already launched a report about AML uh, and made a webinar about the report uh, and uh, the progress in the sector. Today, uh, we will discuss uh, the importance of KYC and AML, uh, digital journey of a customer, regulations about digital onboarding, identity fraud, and sector's approach to digital onboarding and their uh, readiness levels. So first, I'd like to talk about the importance of KYC and uh, AML, Ahmed. Uh, we know that uh, KYC process has a great importance in many sectors. Uh, could you please explain uh, which sectors will benefit most from the KYC? From my point of view, uh, everyone is benefiting from KYC. So it, it's the, it, it is a good process for the human benefit globally. And for my experience, I'm always uh, taking, looking at this problem and issue and also KYC matter from the AML point of view. You know, AML is anti-money laundry. It is laws, regulations, legislation, and globally, it is a tool for us to fight against financial crime. While fighting against financial crimes, uh, there are global organizations helping people to within this fight, uh, while putting regulations, while trying to generate standards. One of them is FATF, Financial task, uh, Action Task Force. They are trying to uh, create a standard base globally. It's an inter-global organization, international global organization. So this organization says that uh, KYC uh, is a very important process and has, uh, should be done via risk-based approach. So basically KYC is knowing your customer. So if you want to know your customer, you have to ask questions. You have to get some details about your customers and you have to do some investigations about your customers. So FATA says that, yes, you have to ask, but you have to do a risk-based approach while eliminating the risks of your customers. So some organization like MASAC, local organizations, they are defining other uh, legislations to, to the country level, to specific country level organizations, and then uh, banks, financial institutions, any kind of fintech organization should apply and follow these legislations uh, to comply this uh, KYC matter within a proper level. So while doing KYC, uh, there are a couple of questions like, who are you? Where did you earn this money? What did you do? What are you going to do with this money? Who are your business uh, relations? What transactions you should done? So to have a better AML, uh, uh, AML action, you have to monitor the transactions of your customers. You have to screen your customers. 
And at the end of the day, you should always know your customer. Knowing your customer always starts at the first stage. So while onboarding your customer to the bank, to the financial organization, to a fintech, maybe an online uh, shopping organization. So while doing these things, there are a couple of you know uh, synonyms. Yeah, you, we call, for example, EDD, CDD, customer due diligence. So customer due diligence has the basic questions, like I said before. But from the risk-based approach, you say that okay, these customers are you know problematic, can be problematic. So I have to get more information about these customers. So you have to move to the EDD process to tackle these risks with the answers. Within this EDD process, you have to prove the identities, you have to prove the locations of the customers, you have to get more information about your customer and uh, their business that can create risk for you and risk for the community. But this process is not that easy. While talking about this KYC process, uh, People always say that, okay, who you are? Yes, this is my identity. Yes, screen myself. Okay, done. It's not like that. It's always not like that. So according to uh, Thomson Reuters research, uh, you know, an average uh, customer onboarding process takes around 48 days. 48 days. And it costs $60 million uh, to global organizations just for the new customers. But as I said before, KYC is not only about the uh, upcoming new customers. You should always do your KYC and always you should ref refresh your data about your customers. So monitoring and screening is a very important part of KYC. And I believe within a couple of years time, uh, we improve this process a little bit more. So KYC applications, uh, within this time period, generated risk scores for the financial institution. As you ask the, which financial institution, a bank and maybe a fintech. So generating detailed risk analysis is important and it is now straightforward. And it can create a CDD process to EDD process later on. And also now we are integrating uh, this process with screening processes. So screening the customers, screening the transactions are now automated, but it is still uh, a struggling point for everyone. So we have to uh, get a, a better approach to this customer onboarding process. And at that point, I think the global globalization is very important and digitalization on top of globalization is another step for us to tackle it, which is uh, digital identity, definitions, verification, and onboarding process. I think it is very important because it will help users, uh, customers while onboarding uh, to the new you know, bank or a fintech. Uh, the user experience will be improved a lot. It will be important for the banks and FIs and fintechs because it will help them to decrease their costs while onboarding their customers. So uh, we usually uh, use KYC and AML in the same sentence. So that's why mm -hmm. I call them as the cousins. Yes. So um, how can we combine KYC and AML with the help of technology like uh, artificial intelligence? That's, that's a very good question. As I said, FATF, the global organization, says that you have to tackle this problem with risk-based approach. Mm -hmm. It means that you can use AI or you can use machine learning while uh, calculating these, these risks. For example, uh, as you know, say, Mr. Selim, we, we have an application for the customer screening, but sometimes it can create false positive alerts. Mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is common globally because uh, it just takes the, uses fuzzy logics and sounding algorithms to try to understand who is who. And while comparing lists like OFAC, SDN list, or UNL Kaide list. So technology is coming uh, to help us at exactly at this point. So if you want to screen all of your customers regularly and all of your new onboarding customers regular, uh, regularly, it will cause you so many manual operations. Yes, 
we talk, tackled that problem. We integrated these processes. So it's an automated process for everyone. But the created results can be huge. At that time, uh, you will lose time. As I said a, a couple of minutes ago, 48 days to onboard a customer, maybe just because of this process. Mm -hmm. So you have created an alert via a system. Thanks to the system, it is integrated. It, keeps, it, it takes two days to help you. Fine. But afterwards, you have to analyze so many alerts. So in, with technology, with the help of AI and machine learning, we can, you know, uh, focus on all these data and try to understand uh, the risk appetite of the financial institution or the fintech and try to understand, try to uh, evaluate the data has been created from the EDD or CDD processes and create a risk score on top of all these details. So at the end of the day, the customer, not the, this time our customer, the FIs, can focus on the high-risk entities and they can spend time on their high-risk entities and users can go much more in a smoother way to a, to a new FI or to a new fintech. So Ahmed, you have mentioned about customer due diligence and enhanced due diligence. What is the difference between those? Uh, the basics of due diligence is know about knowing your customer and basic questions. The first step, customer due diligence, is asking you your identity, who you are, who would you like to, uh, to do business. So how do you earn money? You can simply answer these questions. Where are you? Uh, where is your home? Where are your other counterparties located globally? So these basic questions are easy. And according to your business, business relations, and your, uh, all these data, sometimes we feel that that can be a problem for a financial institution. For example, uh, you can locate it in a uh, war location. There can be a war over there. And you would like to do so many transactions from there or to there, to that location. At that time, you can say that I'm doing this just for medical business. So I'm helping people around there. So this is important, but we have to prove this information is okay. So at that time, we go to the enhanced due diligence part. So we have to site visits to the customer. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the business. We have to, we have to sh sh see all the details and all the, maybe the papers uh, of you to understand uh, are you at risk or not? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Hamid, uh, let's talk more deeply about uh, technology. Uh, let's talk about uh, digital uh, journey of a customer as uh, Ahmed mentioned before. Uh, could you please explain uh, what do we have to understand from this journey? Sure, thank you. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk today. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll start by just adding a few points to um, Ahmed Bey's um, opening in terms of um, why we're moving down this road and why this technology is becoming more and more important. And then we can talk a little bit about the customer journey. So as Ahmed Bey said, there are three uh, main areas that are going to be um, massively impacted by uh, digital on onboarding. For me, those three areas are the societal impact. So from a society perspective, we need to reduce the amount of uh, money laundering or proceeds of crime activity happening in the world and also bring more and more unbanked um, um, areas of the population into um, the banking system. So digital onboarding will, will, help, will help enable that um, because it will help one um, um, root out um, fraudulent transactions, and secondly, also reduce the operational costs for financial services in order for them to start to onboard um, more and more customers um, uh, more profitably. So that's that's really important. Um, from the customers and consumers perspective, it's really important because privacy and security has become more and more of a um, number one concern for consumers. And you'll have seen this in the last couple of years from um, all of the news media that's been circulating about security breaches and privacy breaches. So customers have become much more attuned and knowledgeable about 
um, privacy issues and security of their data. So this is very important. That uh, and and digital onboarding is something that can really help um, reinforce that area for consumers. Uh, and we can talk about that in 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 a moment. And then from businesses um, perspective, the world has changed. So even in in uh, the space of eighteen months, the way that um, people do businesses has changed massively. Um, you're seeing far more engagement in digital channels um, by consumers. They're sitting at home, they're um, engaging with their suppliers, their businesses, their um, platforms digitally. So that is also uh, increasing the need for um, um, digital onboarding, okay? And there's a lot of drivers. So one is obviously COVID and the people are at home and doing a lot more work from home and engaging um, um, digital channels. Uh, more and more often, in fact, there's a statistic that says that most people are logging into approximately 10 to 15 digital channels per week. So that's a huge amount of engagement. So a lot of businesses are trying to find ways in order to protect their customers, not just from an onboarding perspective, but also from an ongoing um, account takeover perspective. Okay. Um, and then fraud has also increased massively. And we're, I'm sure we're going to touch on that as well later, but fraud has increased massively uh, over the course of the last 12 months, mainly because of opportunity um, and also ras rationalization. So a lot of people now have uh, more opportunities to access more online accounts. So there's more um, opportunities for, for fraud and people are starting to rationalize that actually they're just impacting big businesses. They think it's a victimless crime, but it's not. Um, and there's been a lot of backlash against financial services over the course of the last three or four years. So you're seeing a lot more um, attacks happening, especially in financial services as a result of that. Um, and then I think the most important thing is actual business. Um, and a lot of financial services businesses um, have, it's, a, it's an extremely competitive environment. It's an extremely competitive business. In some regions, there's more financial services than there are people. So, you know, there's a lot of societies that are overbanked and there's a big need for financial services industry, uh, financial services businesses to reduce their operational costs and compliance and onboarding, especially in the old way, uh, manually is high cost, as, as Ed McBay pointed out, 48 days to onboard a customer. If you translate that into cost, you know, it can be up to $75 per customer onboarding cost. So that's a unit cost of onboarding a banking customer, for example, in some jurisdictions. That's a very, very high cost, and that can be reduced uh, materially by um, digital onboarding. So these are some of the key drivers that are moving um, governments and countries to start to adopt more and more uh, digital methodologies for Know Your Customer and AML. So uh, shall we understand that uh, uh, with the help of technology, only the uh, FS companies uh, should benefit from those uh, opportunities or uh, also the other sectors? As well. Okay, so it's a very good question. So, uh, of course, financial services uh, industry is the one that has seen the highest value at the moment and the highest adoption rates. So there is a there is a, an external factor, an external driver that is pushing financial services into the digital onboarding space, and that is regulation. Okay, mm -hmm. it's a highly regulated industry, and, and as a result of that, that is pushing more and more financial services industries, um, um, businesses to start to adopt financial, uh, to start to adopt digital customer onboarding, okay? Um, but we're seeing it in um, multiple industries now. It's not just about, um, it's not just about how can you become more operationally efficient for a business. Financial, um, digital onboarding in financial services, for example, is very much regulate, regulate Tory driven, regulated driven, whereas in, a, in other industries where you don't have that external force of regulation, it's more and more customer driven. Mm -hmm. So it's important for businesses not to think about just meeting the minimal regulatory standard. It's about think about, okay, what does the customer actually need and how do we supply the customer with the type of services that they require? And actually the most important thing for customers now uh, more so than consumer uh, uh, consumer journey, customer journey, is security and privacy. 
and especially where you know you're storing very high value data so remember we always say in our business identity from a consumer's perspective is the most valuable thing you own sure and loss of your identity can have you know catastrophic effects uh, mm-hmm. on occasions and certainly at minimum cause you a huge amount of distress so protecting your identity protecting protecting your most valuable asset has become the number one concern for consumers and digital onboarding is the way that that can um, um, that can protect that also customers have become more attuned to the services that they're receiving so they want to know that the businesses that they're engaging with are providing them with secure business uh, secure services i'll give you an example for example um, um, you're now seeing delivery platforms in the us deliveroo's of this world um uh, just eats of this world uh, food delivery platforms starting to engage with identity verification and know your customer they're doing it for their delivery drivers so that they know that the people that are arriving at the door are validated they're potentially safe people that are knocking on your door at night so there's use cases in other areas where there's different types of security requirements okay mm-hmm. so you're seeing it more and more in platform style businesses like um um the food delivery businesses certainly the um um apartment sharing airbnbs of this world they have started to use it um um you're seeing it more in transportation in vehicle hire uh, when you want to hire a car using like the verification services you'll start seeing it at airports and also the telcos uh, yeah. are launching digital wallets and also there's a huge amount of fraud that happens in pay as you go sim cards so they've started to introduce those types of services. so it certainly expands to all industries but the primary driver right now is financial services because the regulator is driving it okay thank you uh, ahmed since uh, hamid opened the door for regulations uh, let's talk a little bit more about regulation so we we all know that uh, regulations have a major role in this process uh, without yeah. the help of uh, regulation uh, we wouldn't be making this webinar today <laughs> also <laughs> so uh, ahmed uh, could you please make a quick summary of the newly uh, released regulation uh, as of uh, february uh, about digital onboarding uh, for sure for sure as i said before aml and kyc is all about raw law regulation and policies mm-hmm. so uh, everything follow this step Uh, last year in in june 2020 uh, banking law in turkey has been changed and it it, it let banks uh, it let the regulation can make a new regulation which can uh, welcome digital onboarding uh, this is important because as hamid said covid world and the new normals are uh, pushing so much pressure on top of every industry and also a very big driver for this digital onboarding issue and the government act really well and fast to change the banking law first afterwards uh, I, i think in uh, in september uh, brsa changed they published a draft legislation sorry published a draft legislation which describes how can you onboard a customer digitally it is basically a similar one to the german legislation which says uh, which defines the you know how the video communication should be done shouldn't should it be interrupted or not interrupted the light levels the education level of the uh, agent of the bank how they can onboard all these people and how they can identify uh, the ids of these people uh, should they check the licenses of the videos should they check the licenses of documents etc so uh, brsa published a detailed one which is very clear for everyone and we were expecting uh, that one is not, not the last one because masag is still on the you know the bar- stop there as a barrier because uh, according to the masag regulations you cannot uh, sign a contract with your customer uh, without a face to face meeting and you have to use a standard signing procedure so with the help of this lightening of this brsa requirement masag started a lot Uh, started to work a lot on top of this and last february uh, within this year uh, they published a new legislation which says that if the fin- if the organizations based uh, area of business regulator allows them 
this is important, allows them to onboard a customer without a face-to-face -face meeting, it can be done. Mm -hmm. This is important, why? Because BRSA is the uh, regulator for the bank in Turkey, but not for the fintechs. So fintechs should wait for the central bank of That's Turkey true. to make it clear for them, to make it possible for them. And also, uh, Masak said that Minister of uh, Finance and Treasury uh, has the right to define the details of I this identity verification process, which is also important. Maybe uh, we should follow also the Minister of Finance uh, who can define the details of ID verification processes. But it is now uh, clear in Turkey, uh, in, uh, we are expecting that in the 1st of May, uh, in the financial industry, at least banks can accept customers uh, via remote onboarding tools. So it is, it is a straightforward process for everyone, uh, but it is clear now that uh, the agent should be trained very well and there should be recurring trainings. The lighting conditions on the, uh, of this video onboarding process should be clear, like mine. I'm in a shiny environment in a white, you know, uh, white light. So the ID verification tool uh, should also be uh, very clear and successful. And also, again, uh, Masak will also ask for the AML part of this, you know, customer onboarding. You should check, you should screen the customers while verifying their identity at the same time to make a successful onboarding process. So, uh, uh, as I understand from your uh, explanations, as of May, uh, we will see some developments on the banking side. So, yes, uh, how about the rest, uh, as Hamid uh, mentioned before, the rest of the industries? Actually, for the fintechs, I believe that Central Bank, uh, Turkish Central Bank will follow it up immediately. So the fintech organizations will be maybe in May, maybe in June, but it will be allowed because all the laws and regulations are there and we can use those laws and regulations. And the regulations of fintechs and banks are following each other in Turkey. So it will be a quick process. But Hamid said something very important from my point of view. Uh, the onboarding and the digital ID verification is crucial for every industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the, last week the, there are Microsoft conferences and they said that uh, there should be a passwordless world soon. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we are using so many passwords to log in systems and uh, thank, uh, I will say hi to my security guys in our firm. Uh, thank you guys. We have to change our passwords very frequently. Thanks for that, but it's not easy for me to keep all those things in my mind very well. At the same time, yes, you can have the password, but as a second uh, authentication mechanism, sometimes for some thing, you have to identify that you are you. So at that time, for any online shopping organization, or maybe you know uh, you can be a taxi driver, an online platform for a taxi drivers, you have to identify yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are you. So maybe the laws of that uh, sector will never let you in there and work there. So most of the sectors will be benefited by these banking regulations because this will help everyone to understand how this is going to work and how easily this can be applied with a good process flow and definition. Yeah. So banking is opening the uh, doors for the other sector. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I, would just, I would just add to that. So the, the password point that Ahmed Bey made, most people on average have around about 40 to 50 passwords saved in, in your Google keychain. So, you know, in Google, when no, I Google. Say, <laughs> like save this password, if you ever go back and check, you will see maybe 40 or 50 websites that you have visited all with either the same password because most yeah. people don't change or um, there will be a multitude of passwords. So that is an industry that will change. And, you know, this technology is not just about customer onboarding. It's about ongoing customer protection as well. So when you have high value transactions that are occurring or when you have uh, password resets, for example, that are occurring or any kind of account information that you might want to change, then this type of technology will become more and more prevalent to help protect customers from um, um, account takeover and um, people um, um, performing transactions 
on their account when they're not the account owner. So we're actually doing a lot of this work with our financial services businesses now. So whilst we're working with them to implement a system which is going to help them with digital onboarding, they're also looking at the same technology to say, okay, we want to use this technology for password reset. We want to use this technology if somebody wants to change their profile details. We want to use this technology if somebody wants to perform a high value transaction, a withdrawal or a high value purchase. So these sorts of add-ons um, uh, are becoming increasingly important for customers. So one of the things that I would just say is um, <clears throat> it's very important to work with and deal with dedicated identity verification um, providers and businesses that have their own technology stack proprietary technology stack so that they can customize their offerings to be able to deal with all of these different use cases that businesses will look to purchase. So I guess what I'm saying in summary is when you look to buy a system like this, don't just look to buy an uh, onboarding platform. You have to think about the future as well and all of the new things that are coming in the next two, three years. And you don't want multiple suppliers. You need to be looking for the right person that can actually grow with you and your requirements in the next two to three years. Okay, so we, we, are, we are going to look for a single solution uh, that will uh, benefit uh, every area. It seems yes. like that, and we, we will see more and more in the, in the near future. Yeah, okay. So, Hamid, uh, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, identity fraud, and I know that uh, it's a major problem in every country, whether it's a developed or a developing country. So uh, what is the global and regional impacts of uh, identity fraud? And uh, uh, how can we solve it? Do, do we have a, a, a solution for that? Okay. So yes, very good question. And you're right. Identity fraud is prevalent globally. Um, at the moment, it is more prevalent in the developing world than it is in the mature markets, um, whilst it is still very prevalent in those markets. So in the US, in the EU, there's been a rising case of fraud over the course of the last uh, 12, 18 months. And actually, it's been driven by lockdown. A lot of people at home, yeah. as I said, more and more people engaging with digital channels and also more and more fraudsters trying to access those digital channels. Okay. Um, the key thing or, or the key takeaway from me is that the highest prevalence in globally in terms of fraud is around identity documents. Okay. So most fraud is committed by people either presenting a counterfeit or a fraud uh, or a forged identity document. Almost 85% of fraud globally is accounted for by fake documents or counterfeit documents. So that's an important thing to note. And that is, um, and then there's three types of fraud that happen when you consider identity documents. So there's easy fraud. So easy fraud is somebody will get hold of an ID, they will make some changes on the ID that suit their requirements, and they will present that and mm. Uh, they use that. So that's easy um, um, fraud, if you'd like. And we're seeing a much larger shift in that type of fraud being opportunistic fraud being committed um, than the other medium and hard types of fraud. Medium fraud is effectively somebody is started to counterfeit security features of the document and hard fraud is they've produced a, a completely forged counterfeit version of the document that is almost an exact likeness of the original. Okay. So this technology can help um, root out those types of frauds quite easily, actually. So if, and, and this is an important thing when you're considering an identity verification provider is what type of checks are they doing on the document, okay? So traditionally, a business will receive a document, they will receive uh, a live copy of it, somebody will take a photocopy, a human being will make a 10 second cursory glance at the document, Make, they're not document expert, experts, they've not been trained in um, evaluating documents, but they will look at a document, they will photocopy it and say, I think this is a true and fair likeness of the original. That's the standard of verification that is happening right now. And actually, even the easy fraud type ID documents are passing that methodology because the standard of verification is reasonably low. Now, as you get into AI-based identity verification systems, you're starting to see much higher standards of verification. So for example, at Armani, we do 116 checks on a document. 
that is everything from checking the font sizes, checking the facial, uh, uh, sorry, checking the um, face on the document against the actual user, um, um, doing validations of data points across the document, um, and also checking for security features. So the, the technology exists to get around the easy fraud. Now, when you get into the medium and the hard fraud, it depends on how advanced your um, anti-fraud engine is in your ID verification um, engine. So just remember, not all IDV systems are the same. There are, once you get under the bonnet or the hood of the technology, you can start to see big differences, okay? So identity fraud is the first thing that people should look at, identity document fraud. And it's generally always ID cards as well. So there's normally ID cards, uh, passports, uh, driver's licenses, etc. The most of the fraud, the 85% that I'm talking about is generally always ID cards as well, okay? Because IDs, ID cards are not standardized across the world. Passports are standardized, so they're easier to spot when changes have been made. But because ID cards are not standardized, that's where you see the majority of the fraud happening, okay? And you'll see more and more of that over the course of the next few years as um, actually the technology gets better for people to counterfeit. Okay, so you'll need more and more advanced systems as the counterfeits become more and more advanced. Secondly, we're starting to see uh, an increase, and this is a smaller portion, biometric fraud. Okay, so there's three or four different types of biometric fraud. There's spoofing, there is masking, so 3D and 2D masks. There's um, 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 uh, sending multiple images um, through, to, through to the ID identity verification um, provider. And the fourth one has just slipped my mind, but it will come back to me in a second. Um, but those, those areas are becoming more and more prevalent, okay? Because it's harder to fake your face. Mm -hmm. People have previously tried to do simple things like take a photograph from a photograph or take a photograph from a video. The technology exists now with liveness detection in order to be able to um, uh, root that type of fraud out quite uh, straightforward and easily, okay? Where it becomes more difficult is where the new technologies such as deep, uh, deep fakes and face masks have become more and more realistic that it's becoming more difficult to um, um, sort those types of frauds out, okay? And that's where the technology needs to advance more. It's not 100% perfect right now, but again, it highlights my point earlier, which is a lot of people, so I'll give you an example, a lot of banks are trying to develop this technology internally. So they have their internal systems, but there is huge development requirements over the course of the next two, three years in order to advance your systems to be able to detect these new types of frauds that are coming into the market. Okay, the last one that I, I forgot earlier was coercion. So yeah. it's, not, it's not fraud, but it's actually forcing somebody to use biometrics against their will. And there are technologies that we are developing such as emotion analysis, behavior detection, that can tell whether a, a, a person is under duress or stress when they're either being asked to perform a transaction or to onboard themselves. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's a lot there, but the main, the main, the main area is, you know, all, all the identity fraud that's happening in the marketplace at the moment, the majority of it is happening because of, of fake identity documents and the identity document that's being faked the most is the ID card. The ID card? ID card, yeah. Okay. So uh, I will not uh, ask about uh, ID verification. How do you make an ID verification? Let's talk it in a, a separate uh, webinar with you because I know that it's a very deep uh, technology uh, and you like to talk about it. But let's do it in a, another. Yeah, I'll way. take up. I'll take up one week of your time. If we just talk yes, about sure, it. I know that. <laughs> so. so, gentlemen, let's talk about a little bit about the business sector. So, uh, we we both know that uh, financial sector uh, is getting ready uh, for this one. But uh, uh, what will uh, what will be your suggestions about the other sectors? Uh, how uh, should they make the, uh, themselves ready? for the upcoming, uh, both the regulations and the technologies. I, I would like to start, if you don't please, uh, mind, please. Mr. Hamid, please. I have a couple of uh, answers for that. And also I would like to add something on top of Mr. Hamid. People are frequently asking me about how a digital onboarding 
can be secured. Mm-hmm. So there are uh, there are simple answers for that, but we have to highlight that before going jumping to the other sectors because I believe that those sectors are still asking the same these questions nowadays to their technical staff or to their you know uh, regular staff. As Hamid said, the emotion check, as Hamid said, uh, the liveness of the document check cannot be done by a, a, a people, by a person on the desk in a branch of a bank. So uh, it is not easy for them to understand if this is a fraudulent uh, or copied document, if this is a uh, ID but fake, if this ID is not uh, good enough. But the system can check it, as Hamid said again, more than 100 points of data validation will be run over an ID. So working with systems with the help of AI is always more secure than doing them uh, by human eyes and human attention. At the end of the day, if there is a risk, as I said before in the FATF uh, organization's requirement, based on the risk, people will then work on that, no problem. So if you keep this in your mind, you can apply this technology for all of the industries, as I said before. So today, uh, the financial sector is trying to find a you know, vendor for these kinds of applications. But I think this is the wrong approach. Finding a vendor for these kinds of technologies will never work. Or developing something, a part of it in, in-house will never work. That can work for a while, but in the long run, you cannot go to market immediately when you compare with your competitors because this is a new area. This is, this area should uh, should require uh, will be required so many focus, and you have to develop new technologies. You will be a uh, innovative company. So if you are a financial institution, you have to focus on the financial innovation. If you are an ID verification company. You have to focus on ID verification. If you have, a, if you are a company like us, an anti-money laundry company, you have to focus on the innovations of anti-money laundry. That's why we are with Amani. So, uh, as Hamid said, yes, we we can develop. The, nothing is rocket science nowadays, right now. If you want to do something just for one week, just for one year, but what is going to happen next year? Can you follow that technology immediately? Can you adapt that technology immediately? Can you be the first one on the market which can implement a new technology which will help user experience go better and better and better? The user experience will be the key for the future for all the industries. That's why I would like to summarize that any industry who would like to focus on user experience should follow financial industry right now, financial services industry right now, about this customer onboarding, and then they will see. Now we are talking about individual digital customer onboarding, but in the short time period, we will talk about organizations. We will mm-hmm. talk about financial services onboarding processes. So, uh, for example, you can be an online shop, and that, that can be a marketplace. You have to know who is your marketplace uh, you know, counterparty. You should know that. So, so many opportunities are over there. Just follow the regulations, follow the financial industry, how they implement this. And uh, I I say that you can easily find a way to implement this to create a better user experience in your environment. Yeah. I'll just, uh, one one other um, point to add to that is... When you ask the question about how should non-financial services industries approach identity verification, we we actually supply some non-financial services businesses, non-regulated businesses. So, for example, we are supplying some cryptocurrency exchanges. The regulations will come into that industry over time, Uh, just like insurance. The regulation will come over time. What we say to customers is don't focus on on the regulation. What we do, almost all identity verification providers will give you a solution that will comply with regulations, okay? Regulation is a minimum standard. Start to think about identity verification, digital onboarding, customer protection from the consumer's perspective. That's most important because there's a very interesting statistic about customers. Almost, I think the number is something like 88, 90% of customers 
place a higher level of satisfaction um, to businesses that have invested heavily in their security. Okay, it's a very important point. So if you as a customer perceive that this platform has invested heavily in security, you will feel more comfortable engaging with them. This has become very, very important for customers. And actually having um, this type of platform in place, even though it's not a regulatory requirement for some businesses, is going to become a massive competitive advantage for them from a security perspective. So if you can say to your customer, okay, I am collecting your ID, I am collecting your biometrics, and then in future, if you need to perform something that is of high value, I will revalidate you, I will re-verify you using the existing data that I have, that's a very powerful marketing message for customers, okay? And then the regulation will come and you'll be ready for it. And you'll actually have um, a, a working system that is operational. You will be able to demonstrate. So a lot of customers ask us, how can we get regulated, Hamid, fast? Well, one of the key things to get regulated is to pass all the regulators' requirements. And one of those is to have the correct digital onboarding um, system in place when the regulation arrives. You don't want to start thinking about purchasing an onboarding system or an IDV system at the last moment. You should look at it well in advance, make it operational so that you can actually show the regulator key data points and say, look, this is how successful we are. This is how much fraud we are, potential fraud we are identifying. These are how many customers we are verifying on a monthly, weekly basis. When you have that kind of data, that kind of um, statistics, to demonstrate to the regulator how effective you are, the, you'll become regulated in a much more easier way. So very important, think about it from the consumer perspective first rather than regulatory. When the, regu when the regulatory requirements come in the other sectors, it will be easy. Okay. Uh, as far as I can understand from these deep talks, Ahmed, uh, I think you have a solution uh, and, and, uh, or you have created a solution with uh, Amani uh, as Finexus. Uh, could you please shortly uh, identify uh, what uh, that solution is? <coughs> yes, thanks to Mr. Hamid. They came to Turkey, invested in Turkey a lot, and they developed uh, that identity verification part. So we have created a uh, new product together for the onboarding process. Now, customers can use their mobile apps, mobile apps or internet uh, banking branches to create their uh, new banking account from uh, the Amani studio. So they can you know, scan their IDs. They can take a photo of themselves. They can uh, chat, uh, make a video chat over that. And at the same time, seamlessly, which is also important, we can screen that customer's background with our anti money laundry products to create a score for the customer, if it is okay or not, and then simply end up the process. In most cases, if there is no fraud, it will be a very speedy process with a good satis satisfied customer. They can feel secure and they feel that onboarding to a new bank and having a new uh, you know, account has never been that uh, easy. So a satisfied customer, a happy bank with the less cost, a satisfied customer, a happy bank, less cost, and a good system from Amani and Finexus. What can I say more? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I will, I'll add a few things. I'll yes. add a few things. And rather than talk specifically about Amani and Finexus system, which I'm sure we can sit here and we can tell you about all the amazing things about our platform, but we don't want to use this as a, as a, a selling opportunity. What I would rather um, do is be a little bit more, try and be a little bit more informative, okay? So when our customers approach us, we try not to say to them, okay, we are the best and you should use us. We always try to give information and uh, make sure the customer is asking the right questions, okay? So what I would say is there are five or six key questions that a business should um, ask their identity verification provider before making a decision whether to move forward with them or not. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of those um, right now. The, the first one is, 
are they a dedicated IDE provider? Okay, so there's a lot of people in the market that do other things. You know, they have other software platforms and identity verification is one of them. Uh, the reason I highlight this is because of all of the things that we've talked about, the changing nature of fraud over the course of the next couple of years. You need somebody who is dedicated and investing in enhancing technology to meet the new threats that are coming up in, uh, in the identity verification space. So that's one area. The second area is don't let price dictate your purchasing decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, some people there, there's, there's a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a vast spectrum of pricing and identity verification, but you need to remember not all IDV is the same. It's just isn't, you know, it, it sounds the same. Uh, you scan an ID, you scan a, um, a face and you get a result, but what's happening underneath in the engines is very, very different. So, don't just look at the cheapest price, look at the value that you're receiving from the product, okay? Actually, a lot of our customers have come to us after having been with the cheapest provider. So it's a, in the long term, potentially uh, more um, um, costly to switch providers. People should think about um, 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 the identity verification journey versus the customer journey. So what's your risk appetite versus the um, uh, risk journey? Because the more, more you try to protect, the greater the friction for the customer, okay? So one size doesn't fit all customers. Every customer will have a different requirement. So make sure that whoever you're talking to has got um, identity verification protocols that are customizable, yeah? We use a, a layering effect, a layering methodology where we layer additional technologies on old, uh, on other technologies in order to maximize the results that are achieved. You need to find somebody who can fine tune them and tweak them to your specific requirements. Okay, so you you can place importance on certain areas that you might not necessarily place on others, uh, and this is uh, very key in terms of choosing um, who you want to use. Okay. Um, and then um, the last thing that I will say is that the most important thing from my perspective is, and this is something that you see lacking in this industry, is how much investment has been made in data security and privacy. Okay. There was a time when you're working with the bank and you thought or you hope that your data is secured because it's all on paper and it's stored by the banks. Now these, uh, your IDs, your biometrics are being stored on platforms, okay? On-premise in most banks and outside of banks uh, on servers, cloud-based servers, how is that data being protected? It's a very, very key question to ask of your ID um, verification provider. How, how can you protect from uh, data breach breaches? So do they have things like, for example, um, different user-based escalations? So users with different permissions to access different information. I'll give you one example of something that we do. Once a, 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 a profile has been validated, we mask all the data. So you can't see it. So anybody attacking the system from outside or even trying to look from inside cannot see the data unless they request permission for it to be unmasked, okay? Finding systems where you can see duplicate accounts because the first thing that happens and this is from our experience, is as soon as you launch a digital onboarding product, the fraudsters will be there. They will be trying to open fake accounts and multiple fake, fake accounts immediately from the first day that you open the system. Have you got a system that can generate alerts when the same ID card is being used for multiple accounts or the same face is being used for multiple accounts? These are things that people don't think about at the start, but once they bought a system and they're working with it operationally, these are the questions that start to appear. Well, Hamid, perfect questions for the ones uh, who are looking for the uh, best uh, solution uh, for their companies. Uh, I think uh, those are the quick takeaways for today uh, from this webinar. So, gentlemen, uh, we're uh, out of time. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this fruitful conversation and discussion about KYC, AML, and uh, digital onboarding. Uh, and the sorry, can I just say one more thing before we go? <laughs> I know we're out of time, but I like to talk a lot, but there is one more important <laughs> thing I want to say about Turkey. Okay? okay. So 
digital identity, and I saw this, this was a McKinsey report, and it's probably my favorite report that I've read, right. is that uh, implementation of digital identity uh, platforms has the potential to increase the GDP of a country by three to 13%. Yeah, sure. That's a really important takeaway from three to 13%, three in the mature markets, in the developing markets like Turkey, for example, mm -hmm. that's double digit GDP expansion. And that is down to operational efficiencies, less fraud in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera, all the things we've talked about. So that's a huge impact on society. That's a huge impact on a country's um, economic standing when these type of systems are brought into place. So it's very important yes. just to mention that at the end. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the reminder. So uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for joining me today at this webinar. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, again, uh, both Ahmed and Hamid, uh, in another session. Uh, we will put all your uh, contact information uh, on the screen. So or anyone would like to contact you, uh, they would use those uh, informations as well. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for the, this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you. And uh, next time we should make this um, webinar three hours long. <laughs> sure. With you, Hamid, five hours will be better. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys. See you uh, in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.